Here in the West Midlands, the march of industry would come to be seen as an invasion, threatening to destroy all nature in its path. Black by day and red by night is what they used to say of this landscape, Britain's own heart of darkness at the start of the 19th century. It's the black country. It was first called the black country by a 19th century American visitor who was horrified by the soot and filth. Today, it sprawls from Dudley to Wolverhampton, but in the 18th century, there were only hastily assembled shacks as far as the eye could see. Coal and ironstone lay just below the surface here, and if you could put up a hut or a cottage overnight, you had squatters' rights to work the land. Squatters started moving in to Mushroom Green in the 1500s, eking out a living making nails and later chains. The black country was the wild west of the Industrial Revolution. People came swarming to these hills, setting up shanty towns, hoping to make not a fortune but at least a living. And at the heart of it all, the Dudley family who lived in the castle here. They ruthlessly, remorselessly exploited their land for iron and coal beneath it, with often rather unpredictable results for the ground above. By the middle of the 18th century, around 20,000 ironsmiths were hammering away within a 10-mile radius of here. But they had no efficient link to the outside world. Until just over 200 years ago, there was one drawback to manufacture in the black country. Everything that was made here had to be put on a horse and cart and taken to the River Severn, nearly 30 miles away. And, and for that reason, they made just small things, nails, hinges, locks, chains. All that changed with the building of the Dudley Canal. Turner stood by the canal's edge to paint this view of Dudley. He took in the whole scene from the ancient castle on the top of the hill to the modern activity beneath it. It's an extraordinary vision. On the right is an iron furnace with piles of coke ablaze beside it. Every square inch of the landscape pulsates with industry. As the barges set off laden with goods, what this picture doesn't reveal is the next dramatic stage of their journey. Beneath the castle, under the hill, was a construction that revolutionized trade in the black country. This is magnificent. It's an astonishing feat of engineering, sometimes only five foot high from the water to the roof of the tunnel, seven and a half feet wide, so you could just squeeze these boats in. The water only six foot deep or even less. It's quite spooky going through these tunnels. It's cold, the wind keeps coming at you. And what's really exciting about it is that by making this astonishing underground tunnel. They were liberating the black country. They were freeing it up. Where it had been virtually landlocked, unable to get anything out, suddenly this offered freedom. Alan, how much stuff could they get through here in a day? Well, there were 41,000 boats recorded in one year. So that would mean that one boat came out of the end there every five minutes if they worked six days a week. And each one would be carrying 20 tunnels and that's a vast quantity of material. We always complain of traffic jams on the motorways. Were there traffic jams on the canals? Oh, yes, yes, yes. In the um, 1840s, boats waited outside this tunnel for up to a fortnight to come through. No, it was really? Bad. Yes. Heavy industry was now sucking more and more people away from the land. 
Soon country dwellers would be outnumbered by workers in towns, slaves to a new machine world. For a visual artist like Turner, it was a feast for the eye. But to a writer like Charles Dickens, more concerned with human consequences, it was horrifying. Dickens traveled through the black country in 1838, and he drew on the experience in his novel, The Old Curiosity Shop. He wrote, on every side and as far as the eye could see, into the heavy distance, tall chimneys crowding on each other and presenting that endless repetition of the same dull, ugly form which is the horror of oppressive dreams, poured out their plague of smoke, obscured the light and made foul the melancholy air. Dickens didn't find industry on this scale at all inspiring, quite the opposite. He was appalled by it, those rows of chimneys pouring out their plague of smoke. He saw more than just landscape being destroyed. He thought people's lives were being destroyed. And a moment would come when they'd rise up and exact a terrible revenge. From being an exciting element in the landscape, industry was now demonized. If Dickens' vision was grim, then the painter John Martin takes us to the very gates of hell. This huge painting of the end of the world, six and a half feet by ten, expresses the horror John Martin felt when he traveled through the black country at night. The fires consuming civilization have become the fiery furnaces of industry, swallowing up the 19th century Britain. The industrialized world is collapsing in on itself. Martin said of the black country that he couldn't imagine anything more terrible, even in the regions of everlasting punishment. For many, this picture of Britain had become unbearable.